Um, I'm going to call this meeting of the Metro Transit Authority to order. The um, well, I'm going to take chair's privilege. The first order of business will be to welcome Janet Miller to the board. Mm, welcome, thank Janet. Thank you. Thank you. And next, um, approval of the minutes of our December 18th. I will move approval. Any changes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right, next we have public comments, and I'm just getting my uh, timer ready here. Um, we are always well, always delighted to have uh, comments from the public. We want you to, to remind everyone that our practice is to limit those comments to three minutes. The board does not generally respond to the comments, although, of course, we listen to them. Every once in a while, we may ask a question for clarity. If there's anything in the comments that needs a specific uh, follow-up, the staff will take care of that. And as you come up here, I'm going to turn the three minutes on, and at when you've got 30 seconds to go, I'm just going to politely raise my hand like this so you know you have 30 seconds, and then I will thank you. So our first um, speaker is uh, Ms. Margot Chambers. Thank you. I'm Margo Chambers. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and because the project scope has changed on the AMP since August 2013, please pull the locally preferred alternative for BRT and dedicated lanes as this saves money. There were things not discussed last week at the Finance Committee regarding the upcoming budget for Metro. The first is a $20 million anticipated expense to fund the Employee Benefit Pension Plan, and this year it's a new expense, and I hope that you decide to fully fund that. The DTO is a designated subrecipient, and the IRS forms filed each year indicate the DTO receives about $40 million in unidentified grant revenue, and half of that pays for salaries and benefits. The other finance expense not mentioned would be the duplicate budget expense of $50 million from last year to provide BRT services. Mr. Oliphant asked for this amount on the third reading of the Metro budget, stating he could not locate the funds in the proposed budget, and this was assigned to Public Works in 2013. So I'd like you to please work out which department, either MTA or Public Works, needs to return the $50 million to Metro Council. Regarding the DTO, I'd like you to have a search for a chief operating officer. We've been without one for five months, and um, the board did an excellent job of searching for Mr. Bland, and I hope we can do the same for bus operations. I'd like a copy of the DTO bylaws, a copy of the agreement between the MTA and the DTO to provide bus operations, and identify the names of the contact for the DTO officers who, who will negotiate with the uh, bus union regarding their upcoming contract. A new employment draft contract is needed by March, and this information will affect your budget, which is needed now by February 4th. Thank you. Mr. James Johnston? Yes, ma'am. You want to speak? Good afternoon. Uh, I call myself a homeless advocate, and I don't know if, this, if I'm at the right place or not, but we have issues that we need to discuss. These folks that live on 8th Avenue South are like you folks. They have to get to work on time, they have to make transfers, and they're really having trouble doing that on 8th Avenue line. The drivers are very rude. They don't seem to take very much interest in their job. You know what I'm saying? And uh, see here. I had it made okay. Buses on time, poor in, in poor areas, especially Eighth Avenue South. Drivers are rude. They get, you know, the folks get time on, get to work on time. And we have another, I have a personal issue, bus stops. On Charlotte, you have a bus, sign, bus stop sign on the wrong side of the street. And I have to admit I stood over there one day till I finally figured out that the, somebody had put the bus sign on, bus stop on the wrong side of the street. It's on the Charlotte line, I think it's coming off 20th Street onto Charlotte. And it's on the left-hand corner, 
should be on the right hand corner of the street where the bus is is uh it's going out but in these poor areas you know and murfreesboro road and we've got too many big buses out there we need some more small buses but i've been riding a bus here for a couple months you know because i'm homeless and i can stay in the valley out of the cold, get a monthly pass, and so, but anyway, thanks for taking my, or letting me speak. Have a nice day. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mr. Peter O'Connor. Good afternoon. I've uh, been here before uh, on uh, a number of occasions. It's been a little while. Uh, there may be a couple of you that may recognize me. And um, I'm not one for being very passive about uh, things that known uh, that are known that need to be done. And, um, you know, when I see no results, then I'm the type of person that, uh, especially when I try to communicate that, and I don't get any communication in return. To me, that's a game, <clears throat> and I don't play. I'm here to be serious. I'm here not just for me, but for other people as well. And there's a lot of people out there that I've spoken to in regards to complaints that uh, I've brought in. And um, a lot of people are in the mindset that nothing's going to get done if I, uh, if I call or go down to the meetings. Why should I waste my time? Well, they don't seem to understand. If they don't say anything, nothing's going to get done. And I've been here, and uh, I like to think that I'm a voice for some of the other people that have complaints as well. And um, some of the complaints that I have uh, have already been turned in. Um, Mr. Felix Castro Dad has some of those complaints that I brought in. And, um, <clears throat> you know, he's not in a position to be able to do anything about a lot of the complaints that I brought. And he's tried to communicate that to those people who do. And uh, operations seems to be the uh, department primarily involved with the complaints that I have. And I'm not seeing any results. So that tells me that uh, nobody's wanting to do anything. And if operations is the department to uh, take care of these things, then somebody needs to communicate and let me know these things. Nobody's communicating. Again, it's a game I don't play. So I want people to know that I'm trying to accomplish something here, and results is the, uh, the thing I need to see within a reasonable amount of time. Now, Mr. Bland is new, and I understand that, so I'd you know, be willing to give him some reasonable amount of time to be able to uh, sit down and, and uh, discuss some of these complaints and uh, try to get something done. Thank you. Steve, Mr. Steve, is it Ryder? Ryder? Yeah, Ryder. Uh, okay. Well, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, it's good to see you again. Um, I just really wanted to thank Stephen Bland. Uh, we had a problem where a person had like a six month suspension and uh, we're able to work that out. Uh, he's riding the bus, he's very transit dependent. There are a lot of people that worked on that, and so I just wanted to express my thanks for that. That was. I think it's real easy to say we're going to impose a six-month suspension, but it takes a little bit of effort to review the facts and circumstances and find out an acceptable solution for everybody. So I'm very thankful for that. He's riding the bus and uh, look forward to the rest of the meeting. So uh, I would like to say, too, that, you know, I think uh, Peter has come here numerous times, and I don't know uh, whether his, uh, he has some complaints. And if you could kind of look at that a little bit to see what, see what it is what they are. I think it's, it's related more to customer care and I think maybe the customer care lines, maybe there have been some hang ups or something and uh, if that could be addressed I think uh, it'd be a little, little easier. I don't think everybody can really come here to the board to address their concerns. Thank you so much. We will continue with our committee reports. Freddie, you're up. Okay. So the Transportation Committee uh, met last week and we had some changes. Uh, we saw the introduction of some trend reports uh, in the customer care and, and monthly quality control summary that Patricia reviewed with us. 
Uh, in customer care, we saw that as we've seen a, a, as part of trend, we were exceeded our 95% productivity goal. I think the new trend reports are uh, a useful addition to the overall transportation committee report, and we'll look forward to seeing uh, as those continue to start to have some year-over-year -year information. Uh, we saw the the passenger survey this month was from the Route 19 Herman, uh, and actually it looked like was graded uh, slightly better this time than the last time that route was surveyed, although there were actually surprisingly few comments from riders who completed the survey. Uh, we did review with Robert Green the monthly operating statistics and saw that mon monthly fixed route ridership declined a bit. Uh, however, access ride continued to grow. Uh, and overall ridership is actually still increasing year over year. Uh, we noted lots of new operator training, and we saw uh, the report on combined regional ridership, which is again uh, grown year over year. So that was what we reviewed, and it was Janet's first meeting with us. Uh, so we welcomed her to the committee. And Janet, uh, if you don't, I'll invite you to add anything else to the committee report at this point. No, I thought it was it was very informational. I'm very interested in. Uh, what benchmarks are versus how we're doing. I mean, to me, if you don't have a good scorecard, you can't really tell how well you're doing. So we had some great discussion about how we measure success. So uh, really happy with that, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank great. you. And that concludes the Transportation Committee. Report. Thank you. And we had a good finance committee. We, too, welcome Janet to our committee. We just welcome Janet all over the place. And continue to welcome her, and it's, I think it's a good thing. It. Janet, from my experience, it lasts a lot. I was going to say, the honeymoon's over after today, isn't it, right? Yes, yes, but it's okay, though. It's good. It's, 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 that means that you're in it and um, all about it, and it's a good thing. So we're excited to have you. I'm happy to have you here with me on the finance committee. We had a good finance committee. We talked about and reviewed the monthly financials, and those were good. Talked about whether or not we needed to reforecast at this time, but at this time things seemed to be on budget as we sort of um, projected. So those were good. Um, also had a good discussion about the upcoming 2016 budget submission, and we talked. Ed talked a lot about um, some of the things that we would be including in that budget submission, which included um, the traditional increases related to inflation and cost of living, and then some specific requests to the Charlotte and Nolensville BRT light operations, as well as the impact uh, to operations from having a whole 100 new shelters around town that we will have to maintain. Uh, also, we also talked in the Finance Committee a little bit about budget opportunities for uh, more customer service training as related to having talked about um, some of the things in the other committees, and that too would be a consideration as we looked at next year's uh, budget submission. Uh, it was a good discussion. I think we all got to really be engaged in the conversation about what budget should look like and what are some of the anticipated needs for next year for MTA, so I appreciate the opportunity to have had such a hearty discussion about it. Um, and I think we talked a little bit about it was going to be working on the capital budget budget coming up soon. And that pretty much concluded our uh, finance committee. And Janet, again, I offer you an opportunity if you had any observations or anything to add. I think you got it covered beautifully. Okay. Thank you very much. And that concludes the All finance. Right. Well, thank you. And Lewis? Uh, Planning and Marketing Committee, we did not did not invite uh, uh, recognize Janet. For the <laughs> Two out of five. Um, exactly, because she's not. <laughs> uh, it, we had a solid meeting, talked uh, as usual about the marketing activities that are going on. Uh, we had a, a discussion about planning, um, which which really segues into the, the CEO's report that's coming up. Um, but the, the, the planning um, is, is of paramount importance to what we're going to be doing this year. Uh, we have already started. Uh, there will be uh, uh, public hearings uh, next month. Um, and, uh, and, and with that, I think I will defer entirely to the, to the CEO's report. Okay, thank you. And I'm now going to switch the order of the agenda items and we'll hear from the CEO before the chair's report. For the sake of amplification, I'll break tradition and speak from the podium this time. Uh, and I'll also uh, dispense with tradition and make this kind of a one-issue report, not that there's only been one thing going on this month, but I know it's been kind of a focal point of attention on transit in the Nashville region uh, for quite some time now. 
But as you're all aware, on October 28, 2014, Citizens Advisory Committee that was appointed to develop recommendations for the East-West uh, Connector Bus Rapid Transit Project that's been branded as the AMP, concluded their work and released their findings. And without doubt, under the able leadership of Bert Matthews, the uh, body raised questions and made recommendations that will make any final project in that corridor much stronger than when it began. Perhaps even more importantly, it elevated the debate over public transportation in general and in the West End, East Nashville corridor specifically, to a level that our region, frankly, has never seen in its history, and that's all very positive. During the final meeting of the CAC, Mayor Dean directed that I review the findings of the CAC as well as any other relevant information and present recommendations with respect to the deployment of higher intensity travel transit service in this key corridor of Metro Nashville. During the past 18 months, the AMP project was the focal point for an unprecedented level of public engagement, discussion and debate regarding the future of public transit in Nashville and Middle Tennessee. Thousands of Nashvillians participated in community meetings, transit talks, business group meetings, teletown halls, and of course the very public process of the CAC. In many ways, people I spoke with who were both for and against the project saw the AMP as representative of much broader issues in the community, such as inclusion, shared prosperity, affordable housing, and how our city can retain its uniqueness that is Nashville in the face of very rapid growth. Many of the media accounts I reviewed characterized the AMP debate in its simplest terms. People were either for the project or they were against it. The project should be built or it shouldn't be built. And in truth, it's really much more complicated than that. Nashville is discovering for itself what many other cities have success that have successfully built robust public transit systems have already learned, that it's really hard to do. In truth, these fights, although frankly where I come from we call them more conversations, <laughs> aren't the be-all and end-all, but they're really part of an overall process for us to collaborate and work toward a better community. And a number of southern cities such as Charlotte, Austin, and Dallas have had similar experiences years ago. And they persevered to build transit systems that are now central to the lives of those communities. And even the original opponents couldn't now imagine life in those cities without those systems. So in terms of a recommendation, with all that as introduction, the bottom line is this, from my perspective. We should not build the AMP at this time in the manner in which it was designed. This is not to say that Nashville doesn't need a high-capacity, high-performance transit system in the West Nashville to East Nashville corridor and more broadly within the region. And just to be clear, I define a high-performance transit system as one that connects all of the citizens of the region to everything that makes Nashville the its city, while also providing a greater range of mobility choices for those who do have a car and can choose to drive if they so choose. Such a system will need to include, in my view, high-capacity, high-performance products to handle the city's population growth and traffic congestion. Such a system will also include robust transit services and facilities in the East Nashville and West End corridors, those corridors that the AMP was originally attempting to connect. To be very clear, in my view, doing nothing from a capital project perspective and simply stopping this process is not an option for this region. So toward this end, I'd like to make the following specific actions for consideration by Mayor Dean and the MTA Board of Directors. Today, I'm not asking the board to take any official um, um, resolution action, um, but these are for your consideration, and we will be back at future meetings with specific action items. First of all, the detailed design of the AMP intended to develop construction documents should cease. Second, that we consider allocating a total of $750,000 of the remaining AMP design funds toward the MTA's ongoing strategic planning process that Mr. Levine referenced a few minutes ago. The intent with this would be two specific activities. First, a very much expanded public engagement process with an overall goal of engaging a minimum of 10,000 people in our region on the broader discussion of public transportation. Second, that we support continued design activities to explore concepts for high capacity transit potential in the West End and East Nashville corridors, but frankly with an idea toward the transferability of those concepts toward other high potential corridors, Gallatin Road, Nolansville, 
Charlotte, Murfreesboro, Hillsboro, and Dickerson, to name a few. Third, rather than simply updating the MTA's 2009 strategic master plan as was originally intended, that we actually use this public dialogue, which is at an unprecedented level in our history, to really try to reimagine Nashville's public transit system. This effort should be used using the findings of the ongoing Nashville Next comprehensive plan, and you heard from Rick Bernhardt on that plan a month or two ago, and also in close coordination with a similar process that's currently underway for the Regional Transportation Authority of Middle Tennessee. Fourth, that in these exploration of design alternatives for the West End Corridor, the East Nashville Corridor, and beyond, that we actively and immediately engage partnerships with Metro Public Works, Tennessee Department of Transportation from the beginning, recognizing that any facilities we build in these corridors are going to have to balance the competing needs of transit, pedestrians, auto travel, truck travel, business deliveries, and all of the things that we heard about through the course of the AMP design process. Fifth, that we actually remain engaged with the Federal Transit Administration of the U.S. Department of Transportation toward the evaluation of projects in key corridors that may qualify for federal funding, such as the New Start, Small Starts process. Very early in my engagement with Nashville, I heard from a number of folks at the FTA that Nashville very much is on the radar from a D.C. perspective for public transportation due to the rapid growth, due to a lot of the initiatives that are going on in this city. And frankly, we have a strong backbone of transit here. And then finally, for the duration of Mayor Dean's term and certainly beyond, that we continue to advance new products and service enhancements that provide very real improvements to our customers so that we can continue our recent trend of record-setting ridership, even in the face of declining gasoline prices. And the following uh, background I provide on each of the recommendations. First uh, recommendation, the most straightforward, is that I'm simply recommending that the AMP project not be advanced toward construction at this time. Second, in terms of the reallocation of funds from the AMP design process to the strategic plan, one of the strengths that the AMP design process has had was the robust public engagement that we've seen, particularly over the last 18 months. By allocating additional resources in our strategic planning process, we can take advantage of the growing attention to public transit as a policy issue in Nashville and expand that participation in the debate to all sectors of the community and to Middle Tennessee. Despite its identification in the 2009 MTA Strategic Master Plan and the Nashville Area MPO's 2035 Long Range Transportation Plan, a large number of people, frankly on both sides of the AMP debate, expressed the opinion that they didn't see how the AMP fit into the broader regional context for public transportation. The recently issued Vital Signs Report by the Chamber of Commerce and the Nashville Area MPO identified that more than 50% of the region's population live in a different county than the one that they work in. Parallel to the MTA strategic plan, the Regional Transportation Authority of Middle Tennessee is conducting a similar planning process and the Regional Mayor's Caucus has identified the funding for a robust regional transit system as key priorities of their organization. The members of the Mayor's Caucus have further expressed an understanding that this system will need to seamlessly connect with local services in Nashville to provide the broadest range of mobility options for their citizens. By coordinating the MTA and RTA strategic planning processes and doing so with outreach to a minimum of 10,000 residents, we would intend to provide people with the opportunity to help build a clear vision as to how all the pieces of this transit puzzle fit together. In terms of design resources, I heard two interesting comments throughout a series of meetings on the AMP corridor and also outside it. Opponents of the AMP along the corridor generally express support for some higher level of transit service in that corridor, but they opposed particular design elements of the AMP as it was presented. And in contrast, I talked to a number of stakeholders outside the corridor boundaries who made statements along the lines of, if they don't want it over here, we'll take it over there. So by providing some sort of conceptual design resource for our strategic planning process, we'd hope to both flesh out facility design attributes that meet a number of transportation and community objectives, and to do so in a manner that's as transfer transferable as possible to multiple corridors in the Nashville region. 
With respect to the West End Corridor, there's no question in my mind that it warrants a high capacity transit solution. According to recent travel data generated by the Nashville Area MPO, the Midtown section of this corridor alone generates the second highest level of trip activity after downtown Nashville in the entire region. As such, significantly improved public transit service in this high growth corridor can help address the dual goes goals of improving access to economic opportunity to those of limited means and also helping to address our growing congestion. Similarly, it's not difficult to envision high capacity, high performance transit corridors in the Gallatin, Charlotte, Murfreesboro, Dickerson, Nolansville, and Hillsborough corridors. Cumulatively, along with the West End corridor, these seven corridors make up well over 50% of the MTA's current ridership. The intent of both an expansive public process and a vetting of design options in various corridors would be to place the next mayoral administration in position to make strategic decisions about transit fairly early in their administrations if they so choose. Third, in terms of reimagining Nashville's public transit system. As originally conceived, the MTA's current strategic planning effort was intended to be an update to the 2009 plan. And I would say as excellent as the plan was, and I've read it probably six or seven times uh, by this point, um, the explosive growth that we've experienced in Nashville in the ensuing years, and maybe even more importantly, importantly really broadened public uh, attention to the transit issue and the visibility of that issue now really at a higher level than at any other time in the history of the city call for a much bolder approach. In large measure, thanks to the aggressive support of Mayor Dean and the Metro Council, the MTA has been extremely successful in carrying out the 2009 plan. Enhancements such as BRT light services on the Gallatin and Murfreesboro corridors, the Music City Circuit free downtown circulator, the Stride Student Ridership Initiative, and the assumption of management responsibilities for the Regional Transportation Authority were crucial precursors to the level of public debate that we're able to have now. Both regional population growth and demographic shifts pointing toward greater transit use all suggest that Nashville is ready to make a huge leap forward with respect to public transit. Development of a broadly inclusive plan that explores the design options in our key corridors as well as how those corridors fit together with the rest of our services will be the next important step in this journey. Fourth, as part of the strategic plan and well before we advance any project, we need to more fully engage our transportation partners, specifically TDOT, Metro Public Works, Metro Planning, and the Nashville Area MPO. In reality, the AMP wasn't a, a transit project, but it was a corridor project. And that is to say the financial investment in this project would have gone well beyond transit vehicles, stations, and the dedicated lanes that form the backbone of transit operations. Investments also included pavement surfaces, sidewalks, streetscaping, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, traffic signals, and landscaping along the uh, corridor and extending to adjoining streets. By way of comparison to a project that was similarly scoped, in Cleveland, the Euclid Avenue BRT project that's now branded as the Health Line was built at a cost of just over $350 million. Of that $350 million, only about $70 million went into the direct transit investments, the vehicles, the stations, the real-time information facilities. Most of that money went into a building front to building front rehabilitation of the Euclid Avenue corridor. Given the reality of the above, many, if not most of the expenditures planned to be associated with the AMP will likely need to occur with or without the project. Quarter investments such as improved sidewalks, pedestrian facilities, pavement rehabilitation, traffic signal upgrades will move forward regardless of whether or not a significant trans transit facility is ever constructed. All of these elements were included within the budget at $174 million. On the transit side, there, there will be public transportation services in this corridor with or without the AMP. So investments such as bus purchases, uh, passenger waiting shelters, real-time information will need to occur. Given that high capacity, high performance transit facilities may well be justified in the West End, Gallatin, Charlotte, Murfreesboro, Nolansville, Dickerson, Hillsborough corridors, maybe others, all also major auto and truck travel corridors, 
it only makes sense to actively engage TDOT and Metro Public Works at the earliest stages of plan development. Further, as pedestrian connections to surrounding neighborhoods will be crucial to the success of any such project, this element should also be planned well in advance by the partners. Fifth, continuing to engage the FTA. The AMP project moved through the FTA small starts really with unprecedented speed. For significant transit capital investments, FTA discretionary capital funding like small starts and new starts can provide crucial leverage toward completing large and complex projects. And FTA staff at both the regional and national level provide an enormous amount of technical support in this arena. Throughout the process of advancing the, this project and others, as we go through the strategic planning process, we need to remain in close contact with the FTA and be ever cognizant of their requirements. However, we can't be so driven to the federal process and the attraction of federal discretionary funding that we overlook the needs of Nashvilleians. Our local requirements should be the dominant consideration in any project development, frankly, even if it means that we sacrifice precious federal dollars. I fully believe that good projects will find funding, so our focus needs to be on developing the best project for Nashville, not necessarily the project that meets the checklists of the FTA. Final recommendation is that we keep getting better with or without a large project. For the duration of Mayor Dean's term and beyond, we need to continue to advance better products and services. Public transit is absolutely alive and well in Nashville. Despite recent trends that have reduced gasoline prices to their lowest point in more than six years, both the MTA and the RTA systems continue to post month over month record ridership levels and these continue to increase. Thanks in largest part to the vision of Mayor Dean, the active support of the Metro Council, the stewardship and oversight of this board, and the professionalism of the MTA staff, Nashville is better positioned than ever before to have the serious high stakes public discussion that is necessary precedent to any major transit investment decision. Recently, we reported several months of record breaking ridership in the modern history of the MTA. And since Mayor Dean took office, regional transit ridership has expanded by well over 20%. Among the many innovations that can be attributed to uh, Mayor Dean and the board are deployment of BRT light services in the Gallatin and Murfreesboro Pike corridors, design and initiation of the Music City Circuit downtown circulator, construction of this facility, the MTA's modern efficient MCC downtown transit facility, Recently, this fall, the introduction of the Stride Student Pass Program for Metro Nashville Public Schools, which I probably hear more positive comments about when I go around the community than just about anything else we do. Introduction of the Easy Ride Program to Metro Government, not to be overlooked, it's about putting your money where your mouth is. The program now partners with more than two dozen employers who pay for their workers to ride MTA buses and the agreement to manage the services of the Regional Transportation Authority of Middle Tennessee in a coordinated manner. On the horizon, we have numerous other enhancements that can be expected to continue the trend of ever-increasing transit usage in the greater Nashville region. These include the conversion of the Music City Circuit buses to all-electric operation this summer, coordination with Metro Public Works on a project to enhance service on the Murfreesboro Pike Corridor, through the improvement of pedestrian connections, bus stops, and traffic signal priority for transit, additional BRT light services in the Nolansville and Charlotte corridors during 2015, the introduction of our, this probably not one you've heard about before at this board level, um, of our automatic vehicle location system <laughs> and our mobile app with real-time information. Mary, and one I know that's near and dear to your heart in <laughs> particular and the installation of 100 additional passenger waiting shelters by the end of this calendar year. Although they haven't been as visible as the AMP, these projects can all be expected to contribute to increasing levels of transit ridership and system acceptance. Through the course of our strategic planning efforts, we need to advance not only large-scale capital projects akin to the AMP, but we also need to focus on those incremental improvements in performance and customer service that make a difference to existing and prospective customers. And I'll just wrap up uh, my comments by saying that in my view, great cities have great transit. In becoming the it city, Nashville has taken advantage of many characteristics that make it truly unique. 
In my position as a newcomer, I may have a little bit of a different perspective than a longtime resident. But I believe that Nashville's creativity, its location, the friendliness that's kind of world famous, uh, the attractive business climate are among many of the attributes that make people like me want to come to a city like Nashville. But by the same token, we still have to grapple with two enormous challenges if we want to see this momentum continue. The first of these is that we have to make sure that all Nashvillians are connected to the opportunities that the city has to offer, not just those with the ability and the means to operate a car. And second, we have to make sure that the growing traffic congestion, which is absolutely a measure of prosperity, doesn't become a precursor to decline as it becomes more and more difficult to move around our region. For these reasons, I think this point is really a beginning of this process. It's not an end. So for the advocates of the AMP who see these remarks, if anything, the reasons behind the project's conception and your support throughout this process are even more present today than when you signed on. We need all of you to stay engaged and continue to challenge the MTA and our community leadership to design, fund, and deliver better services. To the opponents of the project, you've articulated many of the challenges inherent in redesigning transit in our community while accommodating unprecedented growth and maintaining our quality of life. You've told us how strongly you believe that Nashville needs a more robust transit system, and it's now time to work together to make that system a reality. Madam Chairman, unless there are any questions, that concludes my report. Thank you. Are there questions, comments? One comment, Mr. Chair of the Planning Committee. Um, sometimes you have to hit the reset button, and that was a wonderful reset. And so I, I just like to thank you and the staff uh, and the team for uh, for a wonderful, rational uh, explanation of where you're, where you are, and where we're going. And I think now's the time to start the planning, as we said a little bit earlier this afternoon. So thank you very much. In addition to thanking everyone that Lewis did, I also the community. Um, committee that sort of did a lot of work and um, certainly with Bert Matthews leadership uh, they were able to sort of help in this process as well and Lewis I think was on that as well but so uh, thanks to that committee as well it allows us a better opportunity to do the work we do as well so I'll chime in just as the newbie here uh, I'm really enthusiastic about long-term regional strategic vision and many of you know I come from an economic development background where it's all about growing this region and I, th and I think the fact that we're looking at it from a more global standpoint <coughs> is really exciting and I love the words a huge leap forward because I think that's what Middle Tennessee deserves here so uh, I'm just more enthused about being here and think that our economic future as a region as this may sound dramatic but I really believe it is dependent on this kind of a strategic long-term vision. So I say, let's go do it. I'm excited about it. So thank you for your hard work. And I will say, <clears throat> I think as a longtime member of the planning and marketing committee for this board and observing Lewis's participation in the MCAC process, I think one of the most striking things from today's remarks is the 10,000 points of input. This is <laughs> unprecedented for our public process as an authority and I think again drawing a lesson from the Nashville Next process where I've been on a couple of the resource teams. That has been a process of intent in seeking appropriate public input and I think one thing that's demonstrative here is we arrived at this point in part through people participating in this process uh, and bringing appropriate levels of uh, challenge uh, encouraging us to use discretion and be judicious and I think you know as a board as we listen to your recommendations and go forward from this point the allowing this process to become uh, even more public and uh, collaborative as a conversation is, is critical to the success of the region as viewed through the lens of transit so thank you for that thank you and I, I think you can we can conclude from the comments of the board that while no action is required of us, there's a consensus that the approach you outlined, go for it. <laughs> We're all behind you. Um, and, and with that, I'm going to segue into the chair's report, still talking about this project. 
I'd like to just stop for a moment and thank the staff, both the current staff and, and those that also worked on the project but aren't here any longer, and the consultant teams. I mean, this has been an important project for us, and it's been a lot of hard work. But frankly, I think it's been very challenging because of the intensity of the discussion around it. And I just want everyone to know the board really appreciates the professionalism that um, the team has conducted themselves with. And uh, I think I saw a Patriots hat here, and I think this analogy might be appropriate. You know, they, they say something about there's a reason you play the game rather than go with the stats. With it, project development, there's a re reason you do it and that you have the process. Um, this is not the first time that this board, in through a public participation um, process, has gotten input that, frankly, has required a significant change in the direction and the way we go about doing business. So. Um, to that end, I really want to thank all the people that weighed in in this project, both supporting it and those that had brought some concerns to it. I know a number of you on uh, both sides of that debate are here, and I really want to thank you for that. Um, want to comment, and we hope that you will continue to be involved if we're going to have 10,000 points of input in our um, new plan, we're going to need a lot of people, <laughs> and we, hopefully you'll be the base that we start with. Um, so clearly the excitement and focus is going to be on this uh, planning process and, and envisioning what the MTA's piece of a regional transit system will be, and I share that excitement. But we also can't lose focus of our current operations, uh, not that we'll we will. Um, we've got a lot of exciting things going on. I look forward to continuing to hear more about the success of the STRIDE program. And of course, the automatic vehicle locator um, <laughs> system. I know we kind of joke about it, but this is really going to be key to, to lay the groundwork for the system of the future. We will have the technology to manage a ever-growing system, and both operationally and from our customer's perspective to have some real-time um, information. And I, I know we will do well with that, and I'm personally looking forward to the discussions later this month on the uh, implementation of BRT Light in Charlotte, and we hope that those that have some comments and input on that will participate in those upcoming hearings. With that, anyone else? Is there any other business for us? Then I call this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Madam Chair. Hold on.